Hello, all good listeners at Blessed Sacrament School. Welcome to another chapter of Little House in the Big Woods. Today, we're going to do the first part of Chapter 8. It is called Dance at Grandpa's. Mrs. Danzig happens to have a special little copy with pictures for some of our younger readers. So I just wanted to show you some of the pictures first. Here is Grandpa dancing with Laura. Now, they don't have big buildings to go to. The biggest place they have is Grandpa's house so that that's where all the families can come and celebrate and have a good time. The one picture I wanted to show you was how they got there. Notice that Dad has a wagon, but there's sleighs on bottom pieces, and the girls are so bundled up because they're not inside a car with a heater on. They're out in the cold. There's Dad with his raccoon cap, and they're traveling in the woods. They're going to sleep over because they're going to their grandma and grandpa's house. Tomorrow, when we do the next chapter, I'll show you some of the other pictures, but Many of their friends and neighbors also have to travel that distance. And so you can see who's making the music. Pa and his fiddle. So here we go. Chapter 8, Little House in the Big Woods. Our author is Laura Ingalls Wilder. She is also our character in the story. Her ma and pa live in the big woods of Wisconsin, one of our 50 states. Good. Dance at Grandpa's, for those that are following along, we're on page 131. If everyone is all ready, cozy and snuggly, ready to go, here we go. Dance at Grandpa's. Monday morning, everybody got up early in a hurry to get started to Grandpa's. Pa wanted to be there to help with the work of gathering and boiling the sap. Remember, we made maple sugar last time. Remember what they called it? Sugar snow. All right, good. Ma would help Grandma and the ants make good things to eat for all the people who were coming to the dance. Breakfast was eaten and the dishes washed and the beds made by lamplight. Pa packed his fiddle carefully in a box and put it in the big sled that was already waiting at the gate. Laura doesn't get out very often, so I'm sure this was a very special treat. The air was cold and frosty and the light was gray when Laura and Mary and Ma with baby Carrie were tucked in snug and warm under the robes of the straw in the bottom of the sled. The horses shook their heads and pranced, making the sleigh bells ring merrily and away they went on the road through the big woods to Grandpa's. The snow was damp and smooth in the road. So the sled slipped quickly over it, and the big trees seemed to be hurrying by on either side. After a while, there was sunshine in the woods, and the air sparkled. The long streaks of yellow light lay between the shadows of the tree trunks, and the snow was colored faintly pink. All the shadows were thin and blue, and every little curve of snowdrifts and every little track in the snow had a shadow. Pa showed Laura the tracks of the wild creatures in the snow at the sides of the road, the small leaping tracks of cottontail rabbits, the tiny tracks of field mice, and the feather-stitching tracks of snowbirds. There were larger tracks, like dog tracks, where foxes had run, and there were the tracks of a deer that had bounded away into the woods. But the air was growing warmer already, and Pa saw that the snow would it last long? It did not seem long until they were sweeping into the clearing at Grandpa's house, all the sleigh bells jingling. Grandma came to the door and stood there smiling, calling to them to come in. She said that Grandpa and Uncle George were already at work out in the maple woods. So Pa went to help them, while Laura and Mary and Ma, with baby Carrie in her arms, went into Grandma's house and took off their wraps. Wraps means their coats. Laura loved Grandma's house. It was much larger than their house at home. There was one great big room, and then there was a little room that belonged to Uncle George, and there was another room for the aunts, Aunt Dosha and Aunt Ruby. And then there was the kitchen with a big cook stove. It was fun to run the whole length of the big room from the large fireplace at one end 
all the way to Grandma's bed under the window in the other end. The floor was made of wide, thick slabs that Grandpa had hewed from the logs with his axe. The floor was smoothed all over and scrubbed clean and white, and the big bed under the windows was soft with feathers. The day seemed very short while Laura and Mary played in the big room and Ma helped Grandma and the ants in the kitchen. The men had taken their dinners to the maple woods, so for dinner they did not set the table, but ate cold venison sandwiches and drank milk. But for supper, Grandma made hasty pudding. She stood by the stove, sifting the yellow cornmeal from her fingers into a kettle of boiling salted water. She stirred the water all the time with a big wooden spoon and sifted in the meal until the kettle was full of a thick yellow bubbling mass. Then she set it on the back of the stove where it could cook slowly. It smelled good. The whole house smelled good with the sweet and spicy smells from the kitchen and the smell of the hickory logs burning with clear bright flames in the fireplace and the smell of a clove apple beside grandma's mending basket at the table. The sunshine came in, <clears throat> excuse me, through the sparkling window panes and everything was large and spacious and clean. At supper time, Pa and Grandpa came from the woods. Each had on his shoulders a wooden yoke that Grandpa had made. It was cut to fit around their necks and the back and hollowed out to fit over their shoulders. From each end hung a chain with a hook, and on each hook hung a big wooden bucket full of hot maple syrup. Pa and Grandpa had brought the syrup from their big kettle in the woods. They steadied the bucket with their hands, but the weight hung from the yokes of their shoulders. So this is what they're talking about. The buckets are so heavy to carry that they have to use the muscles on their shoulders to help balance them. And Grandpa made these buckets and Grandpa made this yoke. And so this way they could have one trip and take two instead of one. Grandpa made room for a huge brass kettle on the stove. Pa and Grandpa poured the syrup into the brass kettle, and it was so large that it held all the syrup from the four big buckets. Then Uncle George came with a smaller bucket of syrup, and everybody ate the hot, hasty pudding with maple syrup for supper. Uncle George was home from the army. He wore his blue army coat with the brass buttons, and he had bold, merry blue eyes. He was big and broad, and he walked with a swagger. Laura looked at him all the time she was eating her hasty pudding because she had heard Pa say to Ma that he was wild. George is wild since he came back from the war, Pa had said, shaking his head as if he were sorry, but it couldn't be helped. Uncle George had run away to be a drummer boy in the army when he was 14 years old. Laura had never seen a wild man before. She did not know whether she was afraid of Uncle George or not. But when supper was over, Uncle George went outside the door and blew his army bugle. Long and loud, it made a lovely ringing sound far away through the big woods. The woods were dark and silent, and the trees stood still as though they were listening. And then from very far away, the sound came back, thin and clear and small, like a little bugle answering the big one. Listen, Uncle George said, isn't that pretty? Laura looked at him, but she did not say anything. And when Uncle George stopped blowing the bugle, she ran into the house. Ma and Grandma cleared away the dishes and washed them and swept the hearth, while Aunt Dosha and Aunt Ruby made themselves pretty in the room. Laura sat on the bed and watched them comb out their long hair and part it carefully. They parted it from their foreheads to the napes of their necks and then they parted it across from ear to ear. They braided their back hair in long braids, and then they did the braids up carefully in big knots. They had washed their hands and faces and scrubbed them well with soap at the wash basin on the bench in the kitchen. They had used store soap, not the slimy, soft, dark brown soap that Grandpa made and kept in a big jar to use for common every day. They fussed for a long time with their front hair, holding up the lamp and looking at their hair and the little looking glass 
that hung on the log wall. They brushed it so smooth on each side of the straight white part that it shone like silk in the lamplight. The little puff on each side shone too, and the ends were coiled and twisted neatly under the big knot in the back. Then they pulled on their beautiful white stockings that they had knit of fine cotton thread in lacy open work patterns, and they buttoned up their best shoes. They helped each other with their corsets. Aunt Dosha pulled as hard as she could on Aunt Ruby's corset strings, and then Aunt Dosha hung onto the foot of the bed while Aunt Ruby pulled on hers. Pull, Ruby, pull, Aunt Dosha said, breathless, pull harder. So Aunt Ruby braced her feet and pulled harder. Aunt Dosha kept measuring her waist with her hands, and at last she gasped, I guess that's the best you can do, she said. Caroline says Charles could span her waist with his hands when they were married. Caroline was Laura's ma, and when she heard this, Laura felt proud. Then Aunt Ruby and Aunt Dosha put on their flannel petticoats and their plain petticoats and their stiff, starched white petticoats with knitted lace all around the flounces, and they put on their beautiful dresses. Aunt Dosha's dress was a sprinkled print, dark blue with springs of red flowers and green, green leaves thick upon it. The basque was buttoned down the front with black buttons, which looked so exactly like juicy big blackberries that Laura wanted to taste them. Aunt Ruby's dress was a wine-colored calico, covered all over with a feathery pattern in lighter wine color. It buttoned with gold-colored buttons, and every button had a little castle and tree carved on it. Aunt Dosha's pretty white collar was fastened in front with a large round cameo pin, which had a lady's head on it. But Aunt Ruby pinned her collar with a red rose made of sealing wax. She had made it herself on the head of a darning needle, which had a broken eye so it wouldn't be used as a needle anymore. They looked lovely sailing over the floor so smoothly with their, loud, round, with their large round skirts. Their little waists rose up tight and slender in the middle, and their cheeks were red and their eyes bright under the wings of shining sleek hair. Ma was beautiful too in her dark green Delaney with the little leaves that looked like strawberries scattered over it. The skirt was ruffled and flounced and draped and trimmed with knots of dark green ribbon, and nestling at her throat was a gold pin. The pin was flat, as long and as wide as Laura's two biggest fingers, and it was carved all over and scalloped on the edges. Ma looked so rich and fine that Laura was afraid to touch her. People had begun to come. They were coming on foot through the snowy woods, with their lanterns, and they were driving up to the door in sleds and in wagons. Sleigh bells were jingling all the time. So we are going to stop here. We read the first part of chapter eight. We will read the second part tomorrow. We will then, we've all gotten ready for the party. So now tomorrow we'll read about what actually happened at the party or the dance at grandpa's house. So thank you all for coming. I appreciate all your listening. And I really appreciate all your reading. So keep smiling, and I'll see you again next time in Wisconsin. Bye, everybody. Have a great day. I miss you.